is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Tension and queues continue as the UK's fuel crisis goes on. The government puts the army on standby to deliver supplies. Our other headlines, the world's oil producing countries predict global demand will increase despite the climate crisis. Diplomats from China and the EU explore routes for collaboration and cooperation, but human rights remain a sticking point. And after the election, its coalition negotiations next, Germany awaits the colours of its next government. The British Army is on standby to help tackle fuel shortages in the UK, triggered by panic buying at petrol stations. Four courts have been running dry as motorists desperate to fill up their vehicles wait in long queues. The surge in demand was triggered by fears that a shortage of truck drivers would hit supplies. Adding to the misery, petrol prices have hit an eight-year high and there are reports of profiteering at some stations. Nicole Johnson reports. Tension is running high at petrol stations across the UK. Panic buying has led to a shortage of fuel and stations are running out fast. For some drivers, the frustration is too much. Chaotic like this, there's traffic everywhere, people fighting, arguing. It's very high that I have to leave my job and my office just to get a food. That's how high it is. Who do you blame for this? Brexit. I've got a doctor appointment now and I'm still waiting. I'm going to be waiting for like an hour time, you know, which is very upsetting. From early Tuesday morning, drivers were already lining up for petrol in Norwich, in England's east. But many stations have nothing left to sell. In central London, dozens have closed as they wait for more supplies. The crisis has forced the government to put the army on standby to deliver fuel. 75 military tanker drivers are ready to go and this number could be doubled. It's also announced a plan to offer temporary visas to 5,000 foreign truck drivers. The government insists that the UK has enough fuel supplies, but clearly drivers aren't so sure. This line stretches for blocks and people have been waiting here for hours. And the Petrol Retailers Association says that in some parts of the country, up to 90% of pumps are dry. The trucking industry says part of the problem is a national shortage of drivers. They need an extra 100,000 to deliver fuel and food. Many foreign drivers returned to their home countries during COVID and haven't returned. Others left because of Brexit and there's a shortage of new recruits. Brexit, I hear mentioned a lot uh, and it no doubt will have been a factor. On the other hand, it's actually helped us to change rules to be able to test more drivers more quickly, flexibilities that we've uh, received uh, by coming outside of the uh, EU and being able to change the law. Now there's concern that the fuel crisis will lead to staff shortages in hospitals and clinics because people can't drive to work. For now, there are fights over fuel and ongoing chaos. Hardly the smooth transition into a post-Brexit world the British government was hoping for. Nicole Johnston, CGTN, London. Well, Kieran Smith is the CEO of uh, Driver Acquire, a specialist HGV recruitment agency. He says the driver shortages are not restricted to the UK. The numbers that have been passed around and passed to me are about 120,000 shortage apparently in Poland and approximately 60,000 in Germany. And then numerous other countries have smaller shortages, but still shortages all the same. Why is the situation in the UK seemingly so bad compared to the rest of uh, Europe? I'm not sure that it is. Um, what, what we are seeing, though, is the symptoms of the shortage being widely publicised, uh, the most public of which is very recently the shortage in the supply of fuel to the petrol stations. And because that 
particular group of drivers have something called ADR, which is a ticket to uh, carry hazardous goods, inflammable goods, um, they're not easily replaceable. So therefore, when they had uh, a movement of drivers out of that group to other areas, because the other sectors were paying more money, it wasn't easy to suddenly, you know, to quickly replace them. And that then caused uh, a shortage of uh, drivers to deliver the fuel, which then meant that people panic bought. Now, the UK is introducing temporary visas for EU drivers. Do you think they will come? Is that enough? Well, I, I think it's a great step forward um, uh, in, 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 you know, for our government, because obviously our government was, was the one that led us through Brexit. And for them to reverse that particular policy is, is a very brave step. Um, the, uh, the question of whether they will work is, is one to be seen. Uh, there, there, there will be a great deal of um, um, uh, complexity in, in terms of implementing them. I mean, will they be able to be used uh, by the temporary agencies or will they only be used by um, you know, the, the, the companies who, who will have to employ them, essentially? Uh, 13 weeks is a very short period of time. Um, if you consider the, the disruption to a driver to, to move across to the UK, find accommodation, uh, get themselves established. By the time they've done that, 13 weeks later, it's time to go home. Uh, it's not a long period of time. So I think there are quite a few obstacles uh, to, to make this actually viable. Drivers' hours are currently limited on the road for obvious safety reasons. Um, is the suggestion of extending those hours a wise move? I mean, that will surely jeopardise safety, won't it? Yes, uh, well, it will exacerbate uh, what is already a difficult situation. Um, at the moment in the UK, we estimate that uh, uh, we've got about uh, 60 to 70,000 shortage ourselves in, in terms of the drop in the number of drivers. We know that our demand has risen to approximately the same level that we had pre-pandemic. Um, our traffic camera data indicates that the level of traffic on the road of HGV lorries is approximately the same as we had pre-pandemic. What that's telling us is that we've got approximately the same level of traffic, but being driven by one-fifth less drivers. So we're at 80% of our driver workforce. That means that our drivers are currently working an extra day a week or an extra 10 hours a week that's the other way to look at it which is which means that we're already stretching them so to actually extend their hours would be stretching them beyond an already difficult scenario so i would argue that it is dangerous and making it more dangerous the cartel of the world's oil producing nations says it sees a decade of growing demand ahead despite the climate emergency Releasing its world oil outlook for 2021, OPEC says orders for crude deliveries are roaring back after the economic slowdown that followed the pandemic. But the group has added that consumer behaviour is having an impact on oil prices, with less car use overall and a switch to electric vehicles. The group says that within two years, the global economy will be consuming 1.7 million more barrels of oil a day than at present. That means by the end of the decade, total daily use is expected to top 106 million barrels. That will only level off in 2035. However, the International Energy Agency that advises governments on energy policy has warned this figure must be cut by a third if the Paris climate goals of zero emissions by 2050 are to be met, which would mean capping output at 72 million barrels a day. Well, Cornelia Meyer is an independent economist and energy analyst, and she joins us now. Thanks so much indeed for being back on the show with us, Cornelia. So we're seeing oil prices at three-year highs. Why are they so high, and can they go higher? Well, they absolutely can go higher. They are so high because demand has really come roaring back after the pandemic. And OPEC has been rather slow in, you know, incrementally releasing barrels. Let's not forget they cut about 10 percent of, of um, oil production, 9.7 million barrels a day, um, April 2020, when, you know, when, when, when everything went bad because of the pandemic. And they are now slowly but steadily releasing 400,000 barrels a day and putting it back on the market. They go slow because there's so many things we 
don't know, like, will there be fourth waves, fifth waves of the pandemic and so on? So the demand, the supply hasn't come back quite as quickly as demand has come back. Well, let me just pick up on that point, because, of course, we are seeing increased demand now. The economy is uh, bouncing back. But can producers actually meet that surge that, uh, in oil that that increased demand has triggered? Um, yes, producers can producers can um, can can do that because let's not forget, especially in OPEC, they're still they still they still have much more capacity than what they're actually producing. So there is spare capacity there. They're just being a little bit conservative in putting barrels back on the market, which is understandable. At some stage, we will meet more investment, and therein lies a problem because with all the um, ESG requirements a lot of banks are no longer willing to fund upstream and even downstream investment in oil and gas so what does this continued demand for oil mean for climate goals they're incompatible aren't they well, they are and they aren't. What it means is we need to be careful in, in how much oil we, con we, we consume. We also need to be looking more at other technologies like um, um, CCUS, you know, carbon capture, usage and storage. Um, the circular carbon economy and so on. We can't just, you know, it's, there's not such a thing as one silver bullet that will hit it all. We need to look at demand and we need to look at when we, how we deal with CO2 emissions in demand and in supply. We also need to look at um, energy efficiency. So, yes, we can, we can get CO2 emissions down, but we need to be willing to engage in other technologies. Now, look Looking again at the OPEC report, I would say one thing, you know, um, yes, OECD countries do drive more towards electric vehicles, but the demand for oil is growing increasingly towards non-OECD economies. And, you know, they may not have the infrastructure prerequisite for EVs and so on. Well, you mentioned electric vehicles there. Do you think there will be a point where that uh, increasing reliance on them, that increasing adoption of them, starts to have an impact on how much oil we use? Oh, it, it already is having an increase, an impact. It's just the, 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 the rise in demand will go up slower than it would go up otherwise if we didn't have EVs. Let's not forget, you know, we still have a growing world population and we have emerging economies where people want mobility. And at this point, it's the combustion engine that will get them there. And, you know, looking at the, 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 the expense of the infrastructure that is required for, um, for more electric vehicles, it, it will be some time off until they can afford to really put in that infrastructure. OPEC seems very clear, though, that oil will still be our main source of energy for years to come, particularly in developing countries. How can they be helped to transition away from oil? Well, as I said, it will it will be difficult to transition away from oil. They will transition away from oil, but for mobility, oil is still where it's at, especially for these developing countries, for these emerging economies, because they lack the simply they lack the dollars to invest in the in the infrastructure, you know, that is required for EVs and the, the power generation and so on. So, so we are there. And as I'm, I'm coming back to what I said initially, we need to see things not just as, oh, we're using more oil. We need to see, okay, if we use more oil, what can we do in order to capture carbon? What can we do, you know, when we produce it? There will be hydrogen as well. How can we produce blue hydrogen, green hydrogen? So we just need to look at things a little bit more broad-minded than just, oh, we're using oil and that's a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing if we have other technologies going in parallel. Cornelia Meyer, thanks very much indeed for talking to us today. Thank you. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead. They thought it was all over. Germany's election is done, but now the coalition negotiations next. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. 
covering the world from four continents. A new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London. Who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The link only on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Business Europe. China's top diplomats has urged the European Union to patch up its differences with Beijing. Speaking to the EU's foreign policy chief, Wang Yi said climate change should be the foundation for cooperation, but he said the EU should stop lecturing China on human rights. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Giles Gibson, in Brussels. Giles, tell us more about these talks. Well, Jamie, this video conference, these video talks took place behind closed doors, but we do have a summary of what was discussed from the Chinese foreign ministry from the Chinese side. Uh, according to the Chinese foreign ministry, uh, Wang Yi uh, criticized that AUKUS pact that was announced earlier this month by Australia, the UK and the US, which of course is going to lead to Washington sharing its nuclear submarine technology with Canberra. Uh, Wang Yi describing that new pact as showing a Cold War mentality. Uh, of course, we so blindsided by that announcement that we saw in recent weeks. Uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry also say that climate change was a big uh, subject, a big topic in these discussions, uh, with Wang Yi saying that it could be a major pillar for cooperation between the EU and China. Uh, but it has to be said at this stage, we still haven't actually received a readout, a summary of what was discussed from the European Commission side. Giles, this meeting really does come at a rather delicate time, doesn't it? Yeah, it comes just a few weeks after the European Commission announced its new strategy for the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, in this document, yes, they talk a lot about boosting trade ties with countries in that region, but they also call for uh, member states to deploy naval assets to the region to, quote, protect freedom of navigation. Now, we know that in recent years, the U.S. Navy has been conducting what they call FONOPS in the Navy. That's uh, freedom of navigation operations through parts of the South China Sea that China claims as its territorial waters. So this new strategy that's been put forward by the European Commission could perhaps see European states conducting similar operations in the coming years, although it has to be also said that Joseph Borrell, the European Commission's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, when he unveiled this strategy in the building just behind me, he also said that it was about cooperation, not confrontation with China. Giles Gibson in Brussels, thank you very much. The German election is over, now it's coalition talks. Germany's centre-left Social Democrats have started the clock on negotiations, urging potential partners not to play hard to get. The SPD have claimed a narrow victory over Angela Merkel's ruling Conservatives and want to work with the Greens and Liberals to form a government. Our correspondent Ryan Thompson is in Berlin. So, Ryan, the SPD is calling for a swift solution, but this could go on for months, couldn't it? 
Yeah, that's right, Robin. Hoping it doesn't go on as long as it possibly could. But now that we have an uh, election result, the SPD is calling for a swift uh, return to forming a coalition. Uh, they really want to get to work ASAP on this. Uh, but this power struggle that's really emerged in the past few days between the Christian Democrats and now the SPD is really threatening to slow things down. We saw meetings today across Berlin at the various party headquarters from the FDP to the Greens, the CDU, and of course the SPD. Many journalists' eyes were on the SPD headquarters where the biggest thing to emerge out of that was developments that they now know who they want to work with in their coalition. They've been quite frank about that. It will be the Liberal Free Democrats and the Greens, and they're keen to talk to them as soon as this week. But, Robin, all in all, it's been 48 hours since polls closed. This is an election like no other in Germany. And the election playbook has really been flipped on its head this time around because we're nowhere near close to knowing what the next government will look like. The future of Germany's next government is up in the air. Days after a neck-and-neck -neck finish in Sunday's election, both the SPD and CDU are vying to take charge. The clash has boosted the negotiating power of smaller parties, with the Greens and Liberal Free Democrats becoming so-called kingmakers and now likely deciding who will be at the top of the next coalition. The time of the big mainstream parties is over, and the person who becomes chancellor is not elected by almost 75 percent of the voters. That is why there is a different dynamic in this kind of government. While the two parties meet to confirm if they can align their platforms, Sunday's winning party is pressing ahead. Closed-door meetings at SPD headquarters are underway, with a focus on how to satisfy the smaller coalition parties when formal talks finally begin. The Greens and the FDP have been invited to hold exploratory talks with us this week if they want. I think both small parties have come to terms with the fact that the drama they engaged in four years ago does not do justice to the tasks at hand. All the more, I hope they will come to terms with one another quickly. Voters made it clear in Sunday's election that they were keen for change. The SPD, FDP and Greens all saw a boost in support since the last election, while the incumbent CDU suffered historic losses. The final tally puts the SPD one and a half percentage points ahead of the incumbent CDU, a clear win by German election rules. Although the CDU candidate, Armin Laschet, continues to cast doubt about whether it's enough to give the mandate to form a new government. And Robin, it seems that Laschet's last-ditch attempts to find a path to the chancellorship are just not being well received. The CDU leader is facing increasing discontent by some, even within his own party, who say he's not respecting the will of the voters. One CDU member even went on German radio saying it's us, the CDU, who don't have a mandate to govern. Ryan Thompson in Berlin, thank you very much. Well, the Green Party looks set to be influential in the formation of this new German coalition government. The country's third largest political group has doubled its seats in Parliament. In a surprise result, it's now eyeing a possible deal with the Social Democrats to see more on how the Greens have managed their sudden rise to power. Europe.cgtn.com. And don't forget, CGTN is available to watch for free on all of the major digital platforms on Smart TV, online at Rocco, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube, Dailymotion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app. And in the UK, on Freeview. Greece has bought three warships in a deal with France worth around $3.5 billion. The move is part of a strategic defence pact between the two countries. The purchase comes just weeks after a nuclear security deal between Britain, Australia and the United States caused France to lose a multi-billion dollar submarine contract. French President Emmanuel Macron says the deal with Greece is aimed at strengthening Europe's sovereignty. This contributes to European independence, to the strengthening of Europe's sovereignty and to international peace and security. This partnership is not directed against anyone but allows us to act more effectively and closely together for peace, cooperation and stability. 
Talks on the UK's membership of the Trans-Pacific Trade Bloc, the CPTPP, have begun. The UK first applied to join the 11-member partnership in February. Ministers say this is a chance for Britain to forge stronger links with growing markets in Asia and South America after Brexit. The UK signed a free trade pact with Australia earlier this year. Profits have more than doubled at the world's largest toy maker, Lego. It rose 140% in the first six months of the year to $992 million as spending on children's toys boomed in lockdown. Over a third of Lego stores are now in China, where the group has launched its Monkey Kid series based on the Chinese Monkey King legend. A rare cassette recording of John Lennon and Yoko Ono is being auctioned in Copenhagen. The 33-minute track was made by four teenagers who met the pair in northern Denmark more than 50 years ago, just before the Beatles announced their breakup. Estimated to fetch between $32,000 and $50,000, it includes a never-released song, Radio Peace, recorded on the 5th of January 1970. The teenagers interviewed the stars for their school newspaper. In the United States, President Biden's administration is trying to avoid a partial government shutdown. The Democrats have until midnight on Thursday, the end of the financial year, to agree funding for most federal agencies. Well, missing that deadline would see many government functions stopping until an agreement is reached. Let's talk to our correspondent, John Terrace in New York. Uh, John, tell us about this possible shutdown. You know, Jamie and Robin, I love talking about this story, actually. We do it every couple of years. And the reason I like talking about it is he's almost uniquely American. There are other countries in the world that have a debt ceiling. I think Poland, for example, might have one in Europe, which is built into their constitution. But basically, it limits the amount of government borrowing that can go on for public spending. And only the United States Congress, I think both houses from memory, can vote in order to raise that debt ceiling. And, of course, we have a situation where they have a lot of debt, mainly because so many people in the world wish to own and have and hold the U.S. dollar. And that's where the phrase, the full faith and credit of the United States government comes from. And an aside, uh, a reason why they don't want you to have cryptocurrency, because they're going to lose control of a little bit of that if cryptocurrency really takes hold beyond where it is now. Anyway, that's another story. The point about this is that if the debt ceiling is not raised then Uncle Sam is going to go bust, and Uncle Sam will not be able to pay his bills. And the worst of that will be if Uncle Sam can't pay obligations on government bonds, interest rates, that sort of thing. Now, that's the worst crime. It has never happened, but it could happen, and it's always a very, very real threat. It's a threat to the credibility of the United States. Now, in order to stop it happening, every time we get to the point where the government looks like it's going to hit the debt ceiling and therefore basically go bust and run out of money, what happens is they furlough workers. So the federal workers are told to go home, they're not paid, the federal buildings are closed down, the federal parks are all closed down, people can't go there, and this can happen for a very long time. And I remember being on the roof of the Chamber of Commerce overlooking the White House in 2013 when it happened during a row basically around Obamacare back then. And the whole operation, the whole government thing was closed down for about 16 days. Now, the issue is back on the agenda because the government is likely to run out of money on the 18th of October. And so they have to deal with the debt ceiling issue. Now, as you rightly say, there's some deadline coming up at the end of this week. It's all a bit fluid. I'll explain more about that in just a second. Um, what, what, what happened was they had a two-year COVID-inspired debt ceiling moratorium where, under Trump, they all agreed that they would sort of forget about this issue for a while and just put it to the back burner and not worry about it too much. So the debt ceiling was at $22 trillion in 2019. It's now at $28.5 trillion. So there's about a $6 trillion difference there. And what is going to happen between now and whenever this gets sorted, is that Republicans and Democrats are going to fight like rabbits in a sack over it. And let me, I'll let you into a small secret. Don't tell anybody I told you, but they absolutely love it. They love it because it gets them great publicity. They get fantastic publicity on the television, on the radio, in their local newspapers and stuff like that. And so the options are that they will either extend the debt ceiling or they will have another moratorium or they will actually come to some agreement. But I can promise you this, based on my own personal experience, 
Christmas, but whenever they do it, whether it's this week or the 18th of October or more likely Christmas Eve, and I'm not even joking about that, they'll find a way of pushing this down the road. And I've been standing at the Congress, you know, on the, at midnight on the eve of major public holidays before. That's when they'll probably come to an agreement, but they will push it to the last possible second. But I will eat my hat if they don't actually ultimately deal with it, because it would affect the credibility of the United States so much. John said time ticking on a possible um, shutdown, time also ticking on Joe Biden's infrastructure bill. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, amazingly, Jamie and Robin, this is a completely separate issue. You're, despite everything I've just told you about the looming shutdown and when it may or may not happen, but now we're talking about the $1 trillion infrastructure spending. You know, it's big, Joe Biden's big package, his big plan, his big gamble. He wanted very, very much more to be spent on infrastructure, but they've got a $1 trillion bill. It's already passed the Senate. It basically funds funding for, you know, repairs and new roads and bridges and that sort of thing, some other things as well. But on Thursday, at the moment, as things stand at the moment, I think there's a vote coming up in the House of Representatives on Thursday. Now, they've already had a vote in the Senate. However, the problem is that progressives in the Democratic Party, who really don't much like Joe Biden or the senior leadership of the party very much, they don't want to be bothered with a $1 trillion infrastructure package. They want a $3.5 trillion infrastructure package, which is also very much out there. And that's what they're pushing for. And that would include things like social spending on schools and universities and childcare and that sort of thing. And also, crucially, climate change issues, which is one of their absolutely key issues. Now, the prep the problem is the progressive sense that time is running out for them because already looming on the horizon is the midterm elections and they are in November of next year. Campaigning for them will start in January of this year. So once that happens, getting anything done is going to be increasingly difficult for the Democrats. And as you know, not all the Democrats are on board, not all the Republicans, some Republicans are. It's a, it's a very difficult mathematical situation. The Democrats have Joe Biden's party, almost no majority in the Senate, a very slim majority in the House of Representatives, and they are worried about losing both of those in November of next year. So it's another a real fight and the next part of it will begin at the end of the week. Robin and Jamie. John Terrace in New York. Thank you very much. One of the world's largest air shows is underway in China. Nearly 700 companies from across the world are taking part with more than 100 aircraft on show. Xi Jia reports. The best in aviation are gathering in southern China, displaying new technologies and achievements. After almost three years, the 13th China International Aviation and Aerospace Exhibition opens on Tuesday. The event has been a platform showcasing the most advanced aerospace technologies, both from China and the international giants, with a full range of land, sea and air series. A total of 40 countries and regions and 700 companies are attending the exhibition, either online or in person. And the number of pavilions has increased from 8 to 11 compared with previous events. Boeing's exhibit space has increased by 11 percent, while Airbus has increased by 65 percent. It's a key one in China, and so for us it's very important to be here. Uh, we have all our partners, all our customers, all our friends, uh, and so really, uh, it's really a key moment. We will sign some agreements for sure uh, to a good occasion with airlines, with industrial partners in the different fields of our businesses. So it will be a very positive moment, positive momentum for us. And, and I think uh, at least uh, as a foreign company, uh, it shows that uh, there is a, a great potential. Chinese officials say the country will continue its policy of opening up by promoting international cooperation and committing to global sustainable development. The development of the Chinese uh, aerospace uh, brings us uh, new opportunity of, uh, of cooperation um, and uh, this morning we have seen um, uh, the commitment of China on international cooperation and also at international level building up uh, big uh, uh, worldwide cooperation and if you allow me I would like to mention for example the space climate observatory or where China has taken a leading role as well as France and, um, and, and I think it's a good opportunity together to tackle uh, global uh, uh, issues that cannot be tackled at the national level. The Zhuhai Air Show is held every two years, 
It first opened in 1996 and has become one of the world's five biggest air shows. Xijia CGTN, Zhuhai, Guangdong Province. Well, for foreign aviation companies, the air show is a chance to strike new deals. Europe's top plane maker Airbus says it's in talks with China's aviation regulator about certifying its A220 narrow-body jet. We've already started the certification process with this aircraft in China. Our engine manufacturer and us have been working together with China's Civil Aviation Authority to obtain a test certificate. Many airlines have shown strong interests in this aircraft. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Freezing and stranded between Poland and Belarus, the human cost of trying to cross borders. The EU's digital COVID certificate, which offers the promise of unlocking hassle-free travel around Europe this summer. In less than two weeks' time, the Czech border will also open to all EU and Serbian citizens. 4.4 million Hungarians received their first dose of COVID vaccine. 18 and over can receive a COVID-19 vaccination, but it does come with conditions. Third wave will probably take longer to emerge. This vaccination centre is part of a massive effort to try and drive down the numbers of the new variant that was first identified in India. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at death. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we try to save the world. Oh, I can. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. The agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Long queues continue as the UK's fuel crisis goes on. The army has been put on standby to deliver supplies. But Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he expects the crisis to end within days. The world's oil producing countries predict global demand will increase despite the climate crisis. And diplomats from China and the EU explore routes for collaboration and cooperation, but human rights remain a sticking point. The president of Belarus has blamed the West for what he describes as a humanitarian catastrophe after migrants were left freezing and stranded on the border between Belarus and Poland. Five people have died trying to cross the border this month, but the EU has accused Belarus of encouraging the migrants. Our correspondent Penelope Lies joins us now from Budapest. So, Penny, what has Alexander Lukashenko been saying? Well, the EU countries, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland, have been accusing Alexander Lukashenko for months, in some cases, of flying migrants into Minsk and then busing them towards the border before they try to cross on foot. This has been described by the EU as an act of, as a act of hybrid warfare, something they believe is happening in a retaliation to sanctions placed on Belarus because of last year's disputed election. Now, Alexander Lukashenko has come out 
yesterday and acknowledged what is happening on the border, particularly where a group of migrants are currently stuck and a number have passed away over the past few weeks. He has blamed it on the West, on a breakdown there, but does seem to be looking to try and work towards a solution. Take a listen. It is wrong that people are suffering. Yes, we dressed them, we brought them some firewood and some shawls, but they would freeze in winter. These are people who've walked thousands of kilometers from the south. In short, it's a humanitarian catastrophe on the border. Our neighboring country has introduced an emergency and does not let anyone in. And because of that, no one there knows that people are dying there. So, Penny, put this into context for us. What's been happening at the border? Well, we've seen very recently some vision released by Belarusian authorities at night showing a group of people near this border fence that's been built by Poland. Latvia and Lithuania have done similar things, building these barbed wire fences to try and keep people from crossing the land border. In that vision, we can see some sort of altercation with who appears to be a border guard with a large dog facing off with these people. And we have heard within the last hour that a group of migrants have somehow managed to make it across from Belarus into Poland, and they have been detained at a border guard station there. So we will hopefully hear more in the coming days on the fate of that particular group. But Poland says 9,400 migrants have tried to cross since early August, which is why they've put in this state of emergency on their borders, which stops the media, human rights groups, politicians getting anywhere near that border. So seeing this sort of vision at the moment is quite rare. It's quite hard to know exactly what is going on there. Opposition and human rights groups say it means we don't know exactly what conditions people are facing. At least five people have died on the frontier in recent weeks. But the Polish government says it's so that they can ensure that their thousands of border guards and police can monitor that border effectively. So has there been any response to those comments from Alexander Lukashenko from Poland or the EU? Well, the main response that we've seen so far is the Polish government officially asking the president to start to extend that state of emergency for another 60 days. It was due to end on uh, earlier, sorry, in the next few weeks, so early October. It doesn't look likely that will happen now. We're expecting that we'll hear a decision by the end of the week. But they have said that the situation between Belarus and Poland is growing increasingly tense regarding this uh, border situation. If that state of emergency is extended, which is likely, there is real concerns around the conditions, particularly a group of 32 Afghan migrants are facing. They've been stuck in no man's land between Poland and Belarus for the last six weeks. And a Polish charity, a refugee aid charity, has been in touch with them over that time. They've recently released text messages and voice messages, very emotive from those migrants explaining their illnesses, the cold, the lack of food and conditions they're facing, pleading with Poland to let them in and saying they do fear they will die on this border. As we know, a few people have, five people at least, within the last few weeks. So pressure is mounting on Polish authorities to step in, particularly for that group. But at this stage, neither the Polish nor Belarusian side appear to be budging. Penelope Lierz, thank you. United States Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has told Congress that the Afghan army's sudden collapse caught the Pentagon off guard. The Senate and House committees are holding hearings on the chaotic end to America's longest war. Austin also acknowledged there were miscalculations on corruption and damage morale in Afghan ranks. Military commanders are facing difficult questions over the withdrawal in what is their first public testimony since the United States left Afghanistan. The Chinese embassy in London has been celebrating the 72nd anniversary of the People's Republic. It features an address from the new ambassador and birthday greetings from trade organizations and the Foreign Office. Andrew Wilson reports. With a video montage tracking an ancient tradition through to mechanization and modernization, the Chinese embassy in London offered its own celebration of this 72nd anniversary. The theme of the first address was communication and dialogue. Under the principle of mutual benefit, our two sides can expand cooperation in trade, investment, financial services, infrastructure, clean energy, and green development, and deepen friendly exchanges in the areas of education, culture, sports, and tourism.
The UK government was also represented and broadly echoed those sentiments. The government's integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy, published early this year, set out our wish to work with China in order to overcome the great challenges of our time. In particular, climate change, biodiversity loss, COVID-19 and the risk of future pandemics. And other guests with a long history of UK-China relations congratulated China on its achievements. One statistic stands out for me in that transformation. It's, there's, the, of course, the importance of the 800 million people taken out of poverty. China is now the United Kingdom's third largest trading partner. And China is the fifth largest overseas market for British goods. It's no secret that UK-China relations have hit rougher waters in the last five years, and these changes were acknowledged by all who spoke today. But there was also an enthusiasm that things might improve and a determination that the path forward for both countries is one that is shared and not a field of growing differences. There's no doubt that after 72 years, this relationship has altered many times and will probably continue to do so. Andrew Wilson, CGTN, London. You're watching CGTN still ahead. One of the world's greatest railway journeys, Shanghai to Europe Direct, is launched. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world. All around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. What would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. A youth climate summit in Italy has heard impassioned pleas to world leaders to act faster to tackle global warming. Hundreds of young activists gathered in Milan have been invited to discuss proposals with policymakers ahead of Thursday's meeting of climate ministers. The Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg had harsh words for the politicians. Net zero by 2050, blah, 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 net zero, blah, 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 climate neutral, blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear from our so-called leaders. Words, words that sound great, but so far has led to no action. Our hopes and dreams drown in their empty words and promises. 300 survivors of the 2015 Paris terror attacks and their relatives have begun giving evidence in a French court. Their testimony is expected to take weeks. Salah Abdeslam and 19 other defendants are being tried for attacks on bars, restaurants and the Bataclan music venue, which left 130 people dead. Swedish police are investigating whether an explosive device caused a blast in Gothenburg, which set an apartment block on fire. At least 16 people have been taken to hospital and four have been seriously hurt. 
Rescue crews pulled residents from the building while others tied sheets to lower themselves from balconies. The emergency services have ruled out a gas leak as the cause. 33 miners trapped underground in Canada have been rescued. Six remaining miners are expected to be brought to the surface soon. The miners are trapped in the Totten mine in Ontario after an accident damaged their transport system, cutting off access to the main exit. The nickel mine operated by Brazilian firm Vale was reopened seven years ago after closing in 1972. Spain has declared the island of La Palma a disaster zone more than a week after a volcano began erupting for the first time in 50 years. This means that funding will now be released, including more than $12 million to help thousands of people who've been displaced. Coastal parts of La Palma are now on lockdown in anticipation of the toxic gases that will be released when the lava reaches the sea. Dior returns to its hometown with a bright burst of 1960s and 70s colour for this year's Paris Fashion Week. Guests were granted entry only after showing health passes for the event, which is once again an in-person experience after many months of pandemic disruptions. Dozens of brands are lined up to showcase their collections through to the 5th of October. Shanghai has launched its first direct freight train to Europe. Goods can now be transported between China's biggest city and Germany's Hamburg more cheaply and in less time than shipping sea freight. Zhang Shrine reports. With a blast from its horn, Shanghai's first freight train heading all the way to Europe left this morning carrying 50 40-foot equivalent containers full of clothing, glassware, auto parts and precision equipment. Nine of the steel boxes belong to the Shanghai headquartered trading company Cargo Services China which has been using rail freight to Europe for around five years. But previously, its containers had to be driven to other cities to get on a train. Many of our cargoes are from the Yangtze River Delta region. And in the past, we had to first put the cargo on a truck trailer and drive it to Zhengzhou or Hefei. A trailer from Shanghai to Zhengzhou could cost 2,000 U.S. dollars, and it took two or three days to complete the inland transport. Shanghai's first train will leave China via the Alatau Pass in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and arrive in Hamburg in about two weeks. And on its way back in the mid-October, it will carry exhibits from Europe for the upcoming China International Import Expo. The new route is expected to eventually see 500 trains a year and has been very welcomed by the market. Previously, our clients using China-Europe freight trains had their cargoes shipped through other cities, but now they can just start in Shanghai. The trains are almost booked out through the end of the year, which promises increased frequency next year. Over the past 10 years, the China-Europe freight train has developed more than 70 routes reaching more than 170 cities in 23 European countries. And while previously most of the trains were departing from China's inland cities, the sudden outbreak of COVID-19 has brought new opportunities for the cross-border freight train services in coastal cities, as the sea freight rates have seen skyrocketing rises since the second half of last year. A 20-foot equivalent container can now cost up to 17,000 U.S. dollars to ship from Shanghai to Europe by sea. But with the new rail route, the charge for a container twice that size is only 11,000 U.S. dollars. And experts say that linking the rails to major eastern cities like Shanghai offers important additional advantages. Shanghai brings together a large number of multinational companies. So if financial institutions here work with the rail system, they can provide more services in trade settlement, funding guarantees, and cargo insurance. And a large number of international logistics companies in Shanghai can offer a great deal of management experience. If they join the operations, the rail service will be more internationalized and even be able to have additional capabilities in terms of cold train transportation. Zhang Shixuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Across California, more than 10,000 firefighters are battling 11 major wildfires. The fire season this year is expected to be longer than ever, with climate change playing a key role. California has been given $2 billion towards firefighting, with some of it going towards research into high-tech solutions. From Los Angeles, Adiz Tianshan. Air tankers, bulldozers, and thousands of firefighters are on the front lines across several western states battling wildfires. But there's a lot more to firefighting than meets the eye. 
Researchers at San Jose State University in California have been deploying Doppler radars to measure and predict fire weather conditions. We can use the Doppler radar to scan the plume and understand how the, uh, what the winds are doing inside the plume because ultimately it's those winds that are actually driving the fire itself. It's a slow process for now, but Clement says with better satellite information in the future, they could soon predict where the winds might spread embers and start new fires. A technology that could help firefighters be better prepared, according to Timothy Inglesby, who leads Firefighters United for Safety, Ethics and Ecology. We've also got amazing tools to map fires. And with the, with the GIS systems, you can integrate all kinds of data layers, like what are, where are people living? Where are you know, the important values at risk? And that you can employ that in your strategies or where you want to put crews. But some areas are just not accessible. That's where drone technology comes in, and not just for monitoring purposes. For example, officials at Drone Amplified say they can start backfires to establish containment lines around a wildfire. The way these things operate, um, they carry these little ignition spheres. So these are little balls that have a chemical in them. And uh, basically, right before we want to start a fire, we actually puncture them and inject a second chemical that starts in a, a chemical reaction and then drop them. And 30 seconds later, they start a small fire. And these are used actually as a way to contain these wildfires. California and other western states are facing a shortage of firefighters in the face of more frequent and more destructive fires than ever before. California's governor has budgeted $2 billion to battling wildfires, a significant portion aimed at improving firefighting technology. So the technology can and it will help crews if it's applied appropriately. But let's, let's be real, there really is no techno fix available to this wildfire crisis. It's really being driven by the climate crisis. So unless and until we reduce and hopefully eventually eliminate burning fossil fuels, we're not gonna really get a handle on you know burning forests and burning communities. California already uses some of the most cutting edge technology, but many believe fighting climate change is also part of the solution. It is Tianshan, CGTN, Los Angeles. And finally, order your martini. Shaken, not stirred, of course. The uh, highly anticipated and much delayed next installment in the James Bond franchise gets its world premiere in London this evening. A red carpet is being rolled out at the Royal Albert Hall alongside a gunshot marked Aston Martin. No Time to Die is Daniel Craig's fifth and final appearance as the world's most famous spy, 007. The film had been scheduled for release in April 2020, but was delayed by the pandemic. The headlines again. Tension and queues continue as the UK's fuel crisis goes on. The army has been put on standby to deliver supplies, but Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he expects the crisis to end within days. The world's oil-producing countries predict global demand will increase despite the climate crisis. And diplomats from China and the EU explore routes for collaboration and cooperation, but human rights remains a sticking point. And that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app and in the UK on Freeview. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place, from all of the team in London. It's goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.